that, you know, the denominational world, those that really are uh, Calvinistic in an outlook would deny that the elect, and you have to understand how they use these words, the elect can ever be lost. And commentators uh, uh, rebutting that argument would say, well, why in the world was Hebrew written at all if it is not possible for those who are saved to so sin as to fall away and be eternally, eternally lost? It uh, makes no sense. And I would say that uh, uh, at least from the time that I was... <laughs> lived back in the Stone Ages in the 50s. And not only has the denominational world changed, but the church has changed also, and none of it for the better. But we can uh, resolve to live our lives as Christ would have us to live, and the world just have to do what the world does. It's just the way it, it will be, the way it has to be. So we'll continue to preach and teach the truth and, and uh, live it. And if there are those who are more concerned about wokeness or entertainment or the, this, that, the other, they'll just have to be that way, and we'll, we'll be the way that we are. If you turn to your Bibles to Hebrews, the 6th uh, chapter, verse 7, we'll start there. Before we do, though, let's have a short prayer. Heavenly Father, bless this study of ours. We're grateful for the message that's contained in it. And may we search the depths of thy wisdom and thy knowledge and incorporate these things into our lives, that we may be prepared for the uh, Master's use. Keep us in thy care and, and those who are struggling against the uh, uh, enemies in this world. May we all be successful in our desire to serve Thee and bless us in every right way as we study Thy Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, he's uh, continuing the thought, you know, it, uh, just... Uh, I'll read quickly. It says, verse 4, it's an, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become takers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word and the powers of the age to come if, and I, I said last time, if was supplied by the translators, and really the Greek says, and they fall away, and if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. So that brings us to verse 7. For the earth which uh, drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bear herbs useful to those to whom it is cultivated receives blessings from God. And again, he's using uh, ideas from the uh, physical world, material world, to uh, uh, make a spiritual application. <clears throat> and the, the earth drinks in rain, which sustains it, and the Christian uh, drinks in the word of God, or should. And uh, whereas the land, the earth, bears herbs useful, so the Christian who imbibes on the, the Word of God and incorporates in his life, he will also uh, bear fruit just like the, the uh, earth, the soil will. So this is uh, descriptive of the uh, fruit-bearing Christian. Not only is it descriptive of the fruit-bearing Christian, it is expected that the Christian will bear good fruit just like if you have a, uh, a garden and you plant it, you expect good things to come from that garden. You, you know, you get rain, what have you. 
But, in verse 8, but if it bears thorns and briars, you know, you, my garden has a lot of weeds in it, but I have to work at it. And uh, you know, Burnell, she never has weeds in her garden. because <laughs> she, she works at it every day, plucks them out. Uh, but if it bears thorns and briars, uh, that's not the good fruit. So it's rejected. And it's near to being cursed, whose end is to be uh, burned. Now this, the thorns and briars, represents those uh, nominal Christians, those are Christians in name only, who bring no f fruit uh, to uh, perfection. And we can refer again to the, the uh, sixth verse where it talks about those who... who uh, the impossibility of restoring those who rejected Christ. It is necessary for the Christian to continue to grow in grace, to uh, yield good fruit and not thorns. There is no such thing as stasis in Christianity. Stasis is just you're there, you never move forward, you never move backward. That doesn't happen. You're either moving forward or you're moving backward. You either yield good fruit or you yield thorns. In John 15, 2, we read, uh, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So we must bear fruit. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. The pruning is good, that it may uh, bear more fruit, may be more productive. So we should not... Uh, uh, reject the pruning that God uh, visits upon us. In the ninth verse, he says, but uh, beloved, now we, we, he calls them beloved, so there still is a beloved brethren, even though they're in danger of apostasy, he still, uh, they still his beloved brethren. We, and I might ask you, just think about it for a moment. You, don't, you may not answer it now, but who is the we? If you have uh, electronic uh, Bibles, you know, on your computer, you can actually do uh, word searches. You can do a word search in Hebrews on the word we. It's used many times. Who's the word we? We'll, we'll uh, uh, talk about that later. Just want you to be thinking about it. <clears throat> And uh, uh, Hebrews, uh, well, we'll just talk about it now. The, the, the we usually is used as a, a writing technique. Uh, when he says we, he's talking the, the author, is including his auditors along with himself, but that's a, a way to connect with the uh, audience. But here, in uh, somebody's confidence of better things. In Hebrews 13, 18, uh, the writer says, pray for us. Is that the we? Whoever the we is, the audience knows who they are. If it's accommodative or a writing technique, they know that. If there's somebody uh, in addition to the writer, they know that. But whoever the we is, or whoever they are, they're confident of uh, better things. And the better things are going to be enumerated in verse 10. They're confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation. <clears throat> so you might get the uh, impression, and probably a correct one, even though they're in danger of apostasy, apostasy uh, they probably are still in a saved condition, could be, because he says, <clears throat> uh, yes, things that accompany salvation. We're confident of these better things. Uh, though we uh, speak in this manner, in this manner is not the burning of verse 8. 
So he's, uh, at least they probably have some good fruit. And maybe it's um, benevolent works or uh, something, but perhaps they still are doing some good works. In 1 Thessalonians, the first chapter, verse 3, it says, Remembering without ceasing your good work of faith, labor of love, patience, of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, the sight of our God and Father. So perhaps they were still doing some uh, work of faith and labors of love and, and so forth. But they still were in danger. So if they're, if they're still in a state of salvation but can be lost, that uh, rebuts that, that idea that uh, you know once saved, always saved. In verse 10, for he says, God is not unjust. Now, whatever is right, well, of course, as the Bible defines right, whatever is right, uh, God does the right. He doesn't do the wrong. So if it's just, he does it. If it's unjust, he doesn't do it. He said, he's not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, so that in some respects, they're still doing uh, things that they should be doing, in that you have ministered to the saints, you know, ben- benevolence to the saints, maybe, and do minister. Their work and labor, however, was not in study. It uh, may have been in benevolence, but it was not in, in study. In 6 uh, 11, verse 11, and we, again, who's the we? We desire. Uh, and when you say we desire, it, it, it could be some of his audience, maybe, but uh, more likely somebody apart from the audience, from the auditors. We desire that each of, of each one of you show the same diligence. And uh, as God is just, and as they ministered to the saints, he says, to show some diligence in their obedience to and study of God's word or will. That's what they should be doing. So this will increase your faith. In John 7, verse 17, it says, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine. So learning the doctrine is a matter of the will. We have to will to do it. And also, of course, you know Romans 12, uh, verse 2, uh, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may uh, uh, prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of, of uh, God. Again, you have to you have to do this. This just doesn't come because you know one sits in an audience or what have you. It, it takes some effort. Anyway, uh, it says, uh, "Desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope." And the hope is uh, the desire for for some known object or objective. And the expectation and full assurance of receiving it to the full assurance of hope until the end. Well, the end that we're looking for is uh, eternal life. And that's reached only through the diligent use of all the means which God uh, has ordained for our perfection in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. It will uh, make your call and election sure, Second Peter uh, first chapter, verses 5 through 11. You know, I won't read that, but you can read it about the things that you are to add uh, to your faith. <clears throat> In verse 12, and it continues to the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the, the promise. Now, a sluggish person is still doing something. 
but it's just not doing enough. Who through, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You know, there's a future rest for us. We read that in four, uh, chapter 4, verse 9. There's a house not uh, made with hands that we look forward to, 2 Corinthians uh, 5, verse 11. And if we want to get a better idea of uh, those we should imitate, we'll do that when we get to chapter 11. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1 says, uh, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In the 13th verse, <clears throat> we uh, read, uh, For, he's recollecting something, uh, or referring to something before, For, when God made a promise to, to Abraham, you know, he made a promise to Abraham after the uh, sacrifice of Isaac. Uh, when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. Now, just uh, what did God promise Abraham? Well, he, a number of things, he promised him uh, personal blessings. He promised him numerous uh, posterity. He promised that the Messiah would come through his lineage. He promised that the spiritual family would also be numerous as much as the physical family. But the promise looked to a future time, therefore uh, an oath. And we'll talk more about oath uh, later. He says in verse uh, 14, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And this is a Hebraism, and it's a kind of a repetition of, of something, blessing, bless, uh, multiplying, multiply. It just adds emphasis to what is being said. In verse 15, and so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Well, we should patiently endure. We should wait for the promise. And if we do so, it will be obtained. In Habakkuk, Habakkuk, second chapter, verse 3, it says there, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Ultimately, uh, this was attained to the fullest extent, or will be obtained to the fullest extent when the uh, glorified spirits of the redeemed uh, shall enter their full enjoyment of the uh, internal inheritance when we get to heaven. In Ephesians uh, first chapter verses 13 and 14, it says, There in him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. And we'll, we'll uh, address in later verses about this uh, security or surety of the promise. In 2 Peter, the third chapter, verse 13, it says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So let's patiently wait for that while we continually work on behalf of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In verse 16, he says, For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end to all dispute. And for whatever reason, men place a lot of confidence in, a, in an oath. And we do that in court proceedings, you know, where you swear to tell the truth, and hold the truth, nothing but the truth. That's an oath. <clears throat> it's an invocation <clears throat> that uh, 
it's an invoking or relying on a on an authority. In this case, it's uh, God is called upon the witness of the truth of what is sworn, uh, sworn. And it's also an imprecation. <clears throat> and an imprecation is just uh, uh, some punishment, some form of punishment or penalty if the uh, oath is proved to be false. If you swear an oath, you know, if you uh, swear in court to tell the truth and you, they find out you don't, you, you can be sent to the slammer. So there's got to be an implication for a, a false uh, uh, statement, false oath. Uh, well, there's some punishment, of course. In, in this case, uh, <clears throat> God is called upon to punish the uh, falsity of the uh, thing sworn, whatever it, whatever it may be. In verse 17, it says, this, Thus God, determining to show more abundantly, abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel confirming it by an oath. Now, immutability just means that it's uh, unchanging, it's uh, uh, not reversible, it's uh, certain, and that's uh, the immut immutability of his counsel. He confirmed it by an oath. Now, we have to get clear that it's, it's not necessary for God to uh, swear by an oath. Uh, it's for the benefit of man. Man places a lot of emphasis on, a, on oaths. So he confirmed it by an oath, and God deals with men as men. In verse 18 that by two immutable things, that's his promise and his oath, in which it is impossible for God to lie. Now, if he could lie, that would go against his uh, nature. God can do anything consistent with his nature, and he can do nothing that is contrary to it. In 2 Timothy 2.13, we read, If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. He is what he is. <clears throat> In Ephesians 4, verses uh, 4 through 6, uh, it says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called, and one hope of your calling. Uh, well, that's a, <laughs> excuse me, that's a later, I, I get that later. But Titus 1, verse 2, In hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie, I promise, before time began. So he, he has to act in accordance with his nature, and he always will. He goes on to say, in which is impossible for God to lie, we may have strong consolation. Now, the, the strong consolation uh, it comes from the Greek word periklesis. And you know, you heard the word periklete. You know, it's, it's translated the uh, Holy Spirit or Comforter or what have you, but even though this is a cognate of that uh, word, it, this is not the Holy Spirit that he's talking about. It's just, as it said, we have a strong assurance of, of uh, what God has promised. We have strong consolation who have fled for refuge, now, you recall the uh, cities of refuge? It's kind of an allusion to that. We have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Now, this hope is uh, promised by God. And there we can look at uh, Ephesians 4, verse 4, you know, the, the ones of the Ephesians 4, one body, one spirit, one, one hope of your calling. So we're laying hold of that one hope that's set before us. In the 19th uh, verse, it says, This hope, that, that's the hope of the, the believer in the uh, promises of God. You might look at Romans 5th uh, uh, chapter, verses 1 through 5. We have an anchor. Yeah, we have a song, we have an anchor of the soul. We have an anchor, and it's 
and like a ship's anchor. Uh, you know, ship's anchor is designed to hold that ship in place to not let it drift away with the wind or the waves or uh, current or what have you. It's to hold it in place. So we have an anchor. It's an anchor of the soul. And if our anchor is uh, sure and steadfast, which it says here it is, that anchor of the soul, and which enters the presence behind the veil, this hope anchor uh, will uh, be drawn up into heaven. So if we're attached to the hope anchor, we'll be drawn up into heaven as well. In uh, this promise of being sure and steadfast is, uh, you know, it's, it's going to come to pass. In Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 18, it says, uh, For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pa uh, pass from the law till it is fulfilled. So when God says something, it's going to be uh, fulfilled. So we can have the assurance that, that uh, whatever his promise is, it will be fulfilled. In the 20th verse of chapter 6, he says we're the forerunner. Now, forerunner is somebody that, that uh, goes on before. And, and of course, we uh, uh, recall from John 14th chapter, verse 2, Three, you know, Jesus is going to prepare a place for us. <clears throat> so the forerunner, Jesus, has entered for us, even Jesus. While Christ, our uh, hope anchor, he's our hope anchor, while he's there, there is uh, no danger as long as our hope is in him. Our hope is steadfast. And we're the ones that determine whether or not it stays steadfast because Christ is not going to move. It says, Where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek, the order that he's talking about is the priest and kingly order. And Melchizedek, and we'll cover that more when we get into chapter 7. So here, uh, the writer is returning to the theme that was left in the uh, 5th chapter, verse 11. And it's very typical of Paul, by the way. <clears throat> so he, he returns to the theme that he uh, that left off in chapter 5, verse 11. And, of course, it's an introduction to chapter 7 which he really gets into the uh, priesthood of Melchizedek. This refers to a uh, priesthood, the order, priesthood of a certain character and kind or arrangement. And this was not at all like the uh, order of Aaron, the Aaronic priesthood. It was not like that at all, or the Levitical priesthood. It's going to be entirely different, and we'll get more into that uh, uh, as we go along into chapter 7. God never abandons his children, but when one wholly and totally apostatizes, he gives them up to a blindness of mind and a hardness of heart. Again, uh, you recall that. Uh, Verse 6 of chapter 6. In Jeremiah, the third uh, chapter, verses 12 through 14, we, we see this idea. Go and proclaim these words towards the north and say, Return, backsliding Israel, says the Lord. I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not remain angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity, that you have transgressed against the Lord your God, and have scattered your charms 
to alien deities under every green tree, and you have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. Return, O black, uh, backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. I will take you, one from a city, and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. So what we get from this is that God does not give up on us. We give up on God. And when we're determined to do that, he's going to let us do what we want. But if we had uh, abandoned him and continue to, to follow false ways, he will in time harden our heart, and we will not be subject to any appeal at, at all. So we go into chapter 7. It says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. That comes from the uh, uh, 14th chapter of Genesis 17 through 20. You might just uh, look at that. It reads there, the Mosaic system, of course at this time the Mosaic system had not been established. It was still under patriarchy at this time. And uh, therefore there's no Levitical priesthood. He says, and the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shaviv, that is, the King's Valley, after his return from the defeat of the uh, Chedorl Lamer and the kings who were with him, Abram and Melchizedek. Uh, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest. And uh, I, might just, I might just say that, uh, side note, Priest in Hebrew is Kohen. Kohen. <laughs> That's where the word comes from. So he was a Kohen, the priest in, uh, of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Bless be Abraham of God uh, Most High. So that means Melchizedek was a uh, spirit. Abraham, was, you know, he'll say that. Uh, a little bit later. And blessed is uh, be God most high. This is Melchizedek, see, and be blessed uh, be God most high who has delivered your enemies in your, into your hand and gave him a tithe of all. And it will say later that the uh, the, the, the superior one uh, blesses the uh, inferior. So here we have Melchizedek saying, Blessed be Abraham of God most uh, high. So we know that Melchizedek is superior to Abraham. But Melchizedek also says, And blessed be God most high. So I ask you a question Is Melchizedek superior to God? He's blessing both of them. Well, you have to uh, understand how blessing or the blessed is used. And whenever it, whenever you use a word in the same uh, here, just next sentence, it appears to be the same thing, but it uh, results in a a, a result. If, if the result of something is just you know cannot be true, then the word has to be used in a different sense. And so it uh, is here. The blessing of Abram or Abraham, that's a benefit to Abraham. It's designed to benefit Abraham. But the blessing of God, blessed be God, that's an act of adoration of God. It's not a benefit of God, it's an act of adoration. And you can go to uh, these uh, commentaries, and, and that's uh, or the uh, definition of blessing, and it will give you those definitions. So, so one to man is a benefit, and one to God is an act of uh, adoration. Again, as is so often the case, this is a uh, 
uh, a quotation from Psalms 110. The Lord said, My Lord, sit my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool. We know that's messianic. And he says, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, which is also messianic. So we'll, we'll start here and we'll probably start again in uh, chapter 7. And we'll continue right on. And this chapter is going to take some time to get through it because it's uh, not to say other chapters are less important, but it uh, covers a lot of territory, if you will. Thank you for your attendance, and I want to thank Gary for this fan. <laughs> I love this fan. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>